did you get started? Like, what are your earliest memories of music? I mean, like, I, I, I remember when I was probably like six or something, I was constantly playing this Beatles album that my mom had. And I just and I think one of the first songs I was playing was Yellow Submarine, and it just like hooked me because it was so catchy and it's for children. Um, um, and then, yeah, I think the Beatles was the first thing that really got me excited. And then my mom used to play Mozart a lot too, and Beethoven in the house, so we we're just listening to all that all the time, and that with Disney movies, it's just always something that was like I just knew I wanted to do it. There was no question about it. So. The first chance I got, I like took it, which was like in primary school, uh, like during a, it wasn't a, even a play. I think it was for an assembly or something. We had to do car wash and that was in like the fifth grade, but like we changed the words of car wash. I can't remember what the words were, but I remember I was front and center because I was, I think I was the most excited kid to be there. So they're like, I'll just put her in the middle. I don't think it had anything to do with talent more than just like confidence. <laughs> um, is that the song at the car wash? Okay, that didn't. Sound yeah, yeah, yeah. That song, that exact song. <laughs> it's so old. I know. Like, but like we were doing that song, and it was a great, great song. Uh, <laughs> and I remember that, and I remember doing it for the assembly. I just remember being so confident about it, be like, yeah, I can like definitely do this. But was I like, good? Probably not. <laughs> song I was so happy to be there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a funny song when you think about the UAE because I don't know whether, like, the car wash in North America is a place where you go to take your car to get washed and you pull it in and it's really cool. We don't have them here in the UAE. So were you even thinking about what the song meant? You probably weren't. Well, car wash, I mean, we do have car wash in Nanook and like those places. I guess. I just feel like it's, I feel like right. it's different. I feel like, I feel I feel like it's a bit no i feel like if anything there's there's so many car wash here especially right. nowadays like you go to the mall you go to yeah. the mall there's a guy there being like hey like your car is looking a fraction dirty uh i'm gonna clean it and you're like no i'm, I'm okay and then he's like yeah but it's like really dirty so you're like guilted almost sometimes yeah, <laughs> like yeah my car yeah. is a little there's bit more, dirty uh, <laughs> this song is more relevant here there's more car washing going on here than anywhere else in the world. It's actually there's yeah, there's so so much car washing going on here. It's <laughs> crazy, and I think it's it's a lot to do with the sand and probably some of the laws, you know, of them being like you can't have your car too dirty. I think that's a law. You can you can check, but like I'm pretty sure that's a law that you can't have your car dirty. Yeah, I know I've heard that too. Like super dirty. I've yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it'll be because people go to the desert and then they'll come back and they like, can't see through my window. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a cool background, Honduras and Emirati. How does that form inform your music musical style? I mean, I th think or does it? It's not so much to do with the nationalities themselves. Yeah, as yeah. much as it has to do with the percussions of growing up mixed if that makes sense so like when I was younger um it was really hard to fit in because I was half and half and I just moved back from Indiana actually mm -hmm. uh so I was six years old when I moved back to the UAE and I had no clue that I was even from here so I was now in like in a room full of kids who looked exactly like me but they were nothing like me and um it it influenced my music because of the experiences, I guess. Like lyrically, it definitely influenced it because I had to deal with a lot of like bullying and there was like mental health and my identity crisis that came along with it. It was this whole thing. So it really fueled in that music. It made me uh, write a lot with that. But sonically, I would say I have more of an influence on the Middle Eastern side than I do on the Spanish side. And it's just something that is like more subconscious than anything. And now I'm working on being more conscious with that effort. So I want to mix in the melodies and the languages more. With Spanish, it's probably more just like the, the language itself. Mm -hmm. Even though I grew up like listening to Spanish music because that's what my mom plays. Like she plays all this Spanish music all the time, everywhere we go. 
just Spanish music. So it's really funny that it was like the opposite effect. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, that's not really, you don't really hear it in my music at all. Like if anything, you might hear like a subtle Middle Eastern run here and there. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's but Spanish is, is funny. You want to dive more into the uh, Middle Eastern though. It's hot now. Mm. It's, it is, it's very hot. And um, I went outside today for 10 minutes. I went to the gym first and then I went outside for 10 minutes because I wanted to practice my surf skate, uh, which is a skateboard for surf training. And it's like really fun. But I could only last 10 minutes. <laughs> well, I meant it Middle was like 11 a.m. And I'm like, this was hot. a. I went, mm -hmm. I meant Middle Eastern music is hot. Oh, I thought you were talking about the weather. Oh, it like, is. It's so hot today. It is hot. I uh, went no, yeah. There, I think it's really great to see the uh, the rise in Middle Eastern artists nowadays. Like you have Levant, you have like Ileana, you have all these artists that are coming out that are, are singing in, in Arabic and making and modernizing it and they're kind of paving the way for all these other artists to come out and be like hey like you know we're doing this and this is our thing instead of having you know these western artists who aren't of arab descent at all putting arabic in their music and then it being almost a trend hmm. it, like because that's what was starting to happen like you could kind of see it with a few artists uh big like big name artists that they were putting in like little arabic things here and there and it's like when they did it, it was cool but like if an arab artist did it it was like no love but like now it's changing so like i'm really happy to see that yeah it's exciting i've lived here for 15 years and i can definitely feel that this re the world is kind of waking up to the importance of this region i don't know whether that's just my own personal how, how about you living you know in what you're not you're not wrong there you're not wrong there at all like i've i've felt it recently as well especially in the last like two years probably mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i felt it a lot mm -hmm. you know uh like what even when i was in new york funny enough i because i was there for a year oh um, and it was funny because anytime i met somebody and they would ask me where i was from and i would say abu dhabi the reaction was different than what i would get like a few years ago mm -hmm. and that's that's kind of like was my indicator of like oh, like people are paying attention. People are really paying attention now. Instead of like before, they'd just be like, don't know where that, that is. Sounds like Yemen or exactly. something. Exactly. Like not interested, you know? <laughs> yeah, people think it's cool now. Like I feel like in my life, it's just like, what are you doing over there? And then now where people are hearing more and more. And when I say, hey, it's the middle of the world. Like everyone lives there. It's the place to be. People are buying it yeah no and it's at a rapid rate too like it's uh you could you could definitely see it especially in dubai uh there's uh, almost like nowhere to breathe yeah it's it's there even. anymore it's literally <laughs> so what's it like so i said like a lot it's, <laughs> okay so it's weird to ask you what's it like being a musician in the uae because i just thought a weird question honestly I, it's not a weird question at all okay so what is it what is it like <laughs> It well, it's it's interesting, right? Because you have um, you have a lot of people who do music have full time jobs, mm. you know, and so so like their music isn't priority one. No matter how bad they want music to be priority one, it is not priority one because you have a nine to five. Okay. I've done it. I've been there. It is extremely difficult. It, it's doable for sure, but you're gonna have to sacrifice a lot. And I think the things that you sacrifice are not worth it in my opinion so like yeah so when i had a nine to five um and i was doing my music full time you just like picture this waking up up at like five or six in the morning and then going to the gym uh and then going to work and then leaving work at what was like four o'clock three thirty to four depend if i got there at seven thirty or eight they leave at four, go home, get ready, go to Dubai, gig, come home at like one o'clock in the morning, repeat, rinse, repeat, events, rinse, repeat. So you're like, where's the time to to relax? Where's the time to unwind? Where's the time to eat, actually? You know what I mean? Like, wh where are you putting time for yourself in this busy day? Like that, it's really impressive that you're doing all of this, but it's not impressive at all because you're killing yourself and that. That's essentially what I was doing okay, so for, for a few you, years. I think it was about like... How many? Mm -hmm. How many years? Oh, it was about like, I think like... Um, 
um, like three years almost. Wow. So it was like three years. And it was funny because when I was, I was working, I, I got sent to the hospital and uh, the doctor was like, you know, you're like super stressed out. Right. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I think it's a very common thing with people that like someone will look at them and go, you look really stressed. And you're like, I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. People can see it. People see it before you see it sometimes. <laughs> and uh, I definitely was very, very stressed out. And I think I was just wired. I think that's what she was saying is that I was just very wired and very like, okay, I got to be somewhere else. I got to go do this. I got to do this. And so I was very stressed for, for like three years. Did that hurt your health or your mental health? Like, Oh, a hundred percent. It, it hurt everything from A to Z. Like uh, to, I got sent to the hospital because I was having a month long migraine. And I, it came to the point where I couldn't go to work because I couldn't see the screen. I couldn't drive. I couldn't even like get out of bed because it was the migraines were so intense. It had to be completely silent. So like forget about, you know, like, oh, I can't look at the computer. I can't listen to music. I can't do my job. I can't do any of the jobs that I was that like I was there to do, you know. So uh, that was only like step one. <laughs> it was like, OK, migraines. And then after the migraines is the insomnia after the and then now because of the insomnia, now you're getting anxiety. Now the anxiety, now you're getting malnourished and, and dehydrated because you can't keep food down or you can't keep it in your system. So now you're dizzy and you're all over the place. And and like I wasn't serving anybody any good because I was basically immobile. And uh and then uh then yeah, I, I got completely burnt out. I think to the point where my body just said no and I couldn't walk for a little bit because my ligaments and my muscles were all messed up. And uh, and that's when I was doing my master's degree. I was already burnt out before I went to go do my master's. So I think by doing it was just pushing the needle a bit too far. Uh, yeah. But I'm glad I did it. But when I came back, I came back in a wheelchair and I went, I don't want anyone to talk to me for the next few months. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew I needed to, to like relax. Yeah, I was like, I haven't taken a vacation. I haven't, I, I like, I haven't really enjoyed life in the past, like probably eight years. Because even when I was doing my undergrad, I was trying to hurry it up so that I could get a job, so that I could hurry that up, so I could do my music. Like, I had this whole thing in my head that I'm like, if I just rush through the things that people want me to do and expect me to do, I can I can go do the things that I actually wanted to do, which mm -hmm. is, I think, a terrible way of thinking. <laughs> oh, I think like that sometimes, too. So. So you're, were you feeling, yeah. you're feeling anxiety, but it's basically coming out in physical symptoms because you're not letting yourself feel how. Exactly. You're like, oh, I'll just, I'll just, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Everything is okay until everything is not okay. And then like you, you get blinded from a panic attack, you know? Mm -hmm. What do you do but, when uh, you're super passionate about mm -hmm. something? What do you do when you're super passionate and driven about something? Like, I don't know how you, like, what would you do differently? Or did you just have to get here to figure it out you know it's like that's where that's where a lot of of that awareness and like inner i guess work had to come into play because because i i get you 100 percent. where it's just like but this is what you love doing how how is the thing that you love doing killing you you know and it's because i think we get so excited and we're so passionate and we're so driven by our goals um that we can forget to take care of ourselves and forget that taking care of ourselves is just as important as doing or, or going that goal. So having time to meditate or go to the gym or cook a healthy meal, that's not wasted time. That's valuable time. But in my mind at the time, I'm like, well, I don't have time to do any of that stuff. I wasn't giving myself the time to do that stuff. I was just like, I need to go to the studio. I need to go rehearse for this gig. I need to go make this content. I need to do this and that. I need to see this person and, um, and not allowing myself the time to actually breathe. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it has to do with us just being so driven by our goals and, and like being like, well, he and it's another part of, well, this is what people expect me to do too, mm -hmm. you know? that you're expect you're almost you're expected to turn out this content you're expected to be doing these gigs you're expected to be singing all the time you're expected you know and but i think in reality and i'm going to like contradict myself you're not really expected to do anything i don't think anyone cares that much <laughs> and that's a good thing <laughs> <laughs> it's a worth thing cuz i know i've had this same issue and i'm a lot older than you and mm -hmm. i'm learning it a lot later right and 
you, you know, it's good that you got this ironed out younger because otherwise you can end up with an autoimmune disorder or something. But do you think it's a worth thing? Cause I, I feel like for me, it's like, I have to prove my worth somehow. And I'm learning to just yeah. say, you know what? You're just worthy. Like you don't have to work, like show everyone with this. Mask. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what like, and, and that's why I was like, you know what? It, it, all these things that you think people are expecting are in your head. Nobody's <laughs> expecting anything. Really, I'm like, no one's expecting anything. No one ever. Uh, people, you know what people are expecting you to do? Whatever it is that you do. <laughs> so, so it's just like you kind of are the one who determine what that thing is, and you set those expectations instead of letting other people set them for you. So it's 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 a hundred percent to do with with worth as well, because you feel like. Well, this is like personally for me, but it's just like, well, I felt like, okay, well, if I don't, if I don't do this then I'm going to be forgotten, mm. you know, mm. and I'm going to be left behind and no one's going to, no one's going to support me and no one's going to care about it. And it's a very like negative way of like thinking. And, and it's okay to have those thoughts as long as you kind of like get to the root of it and be like, wait, well, but why are you, why are you feeling like that? Why are you, why are you feeling like you're not worth it or that people are expecting these things? And when you get to the root of it, I, like that's when I like realize, oh, it's all in my head. <laughs> it's quite literally all in my head and I need to calm down. <laughs> what steps did you take to address that and iron it out? Because I think this is a problem for a lot of people. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you have to hit rock bottom. I, like, I mean, like, I don't want people to hit rock bottom, but I hit rock bottom. And, and I think I hit it a few times, to be honest with you because you don't learn the first few but um when uh when the anxiety attacks started happening that was that was almost it for me i didn't learn too much from that but what i did start doing is uh meditating more i was meditating a little bit before that like just you know casually whatever but i made it more of a routine for m for myself to to meditate and uh and to just calm the mind it, that's i have an overactive mind i have adhd and that has a lot to do with as well i think the anxiety and the burnout and all those things that were happening because i'm also like heavily heavily unmedicated and unhinged <laughs> so i was trying to find different ways to cope with my adhd and um meditation was one of the first things that i did and then uh setting setting myself a routine i tried to do that because i heard from like different books and like different podcasts and things that like people with ADHD really like thrive on on routine like if you if you don't want to take medication like you have to make sure that you're kind of like on the ball with things but I found that having a routine or at least like trying to stick to this consistent routine was becoming overwhelming and was starting to stress me out so I learned to forgive myself a lot and that it was okay not to be on the ball 24 7 and also i had to relook at my my career as well and see what i wanted from it i'm like did i did if i wanted sustainability i had to change something otherwise like god forbid but i would have been dead you know like from just pure exhaustion and um i started saying no to a lot of things uh and because i i think i used to say yes to things for the sake of saying yes and you know i i kind of bought the the whole like oh but this is going to be super good for you and the exposure and the whole thing and, and like i don't know all this stuff or whatever even if they're paying right mm -hmm. um but then a lot of the times i would go and do these gigs and it like they were great and i love being on stage and everything but there were some of them that i wish i had said no to just on the pure fact of me being tired and had nothing to do with the actual event it had everything to do with me mm -hmm. and um i would find out after that event or opportunity sorry uh I, I could have gone without it. I could have, it definitely could have like not happened <laughs> and it right. wouldn't have changed anything, right. you know, cause it goes back to that expectation thing. Right. right. Saying no. Yeah. So, a lot of yeah. yeah. I mean, so, so, so like when I came back from New York, I think is when I really, it really, really hit me hard because I started uh, to think that I do not want to sing anymore and not like permanent not sing anymore but i'm like i do not want to sing i do not want to write a song i don't even want to listen to music and i'm like and i need to figure out <laughs> what's going on in here so that i can find that love again because i didn't want to be without it but i knew that i didn't want it at that time so i just 
let myself not do anything really that was just like okay you don't have to be anywhere don't be there if you have to be somewhere go but you know be patient with yourself or whatever if it was absolutely mandatory but if it wasn't mandatory i wasn't you wouldn't see my face okay how long were you able to do that for I mean, see, I quit my job before I moved to New York because that was one of the <laughs> it was one of the things. Um, and uh, so when I came back, I had no job. Uh, it, well, no, like, you know, nine to five job. So I would take like gigs here and there just to sustain my su- sustain myself a little bit financially so that I want to get stressed about my finances either. Uh, but I was I mean, I'm still kind of doing it now. I was actually thinking the other day that. uh I was like, okay, well, you're pretty much like almost there. But then I had something happen last week that just sent me a little bit back. And it was a performance that I had done. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, you're not fully ready yet. Like you thought you were kind of ready, but you're, you're, you're not quite ready yet because still mentally you're still burnt out. Yeah. So not ready yet. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, and it it was, it was very interesting because like I, up until just before the event, my voice was fine. And then miraculously, right before the event, I lost my voice. Mm. And uh, mm. this is a thing that used to happen when I was younger as well. And I think I kind of narrowed it down a little bit because I spoke to a voice therapist and uh, a voice specialist as well for, uh, in Cleveland. And they both were like, well, how stressed are you? <laughs> and how much are you sleeping? I'm like, well, not a lot. And they're like, well, there's your answer. It's got nothing to do with your vocal cords. It has everything to do with your state of mind. Wow. And those and those play a factor. You know, the hormones, they go, they pump, whatever. Now your vocal cords are dehydrated. You're not sleeping, so they're tired. So, of course, I mean, have you ever, like, you know, done an all-nighter? Have you talked after an all-nighter? Have you heard yourself? How yeah. do you sound after an all-nighter? It's a great sound. It sounds like you should be in a movie as, like, a sexy female character. <laughs> but you know what I, you know what i mean Literally. like it's it's not yeah and, and it's not ideal it's not an ideal circumstance to be in especially when you have to perform so uh that was something that i'm now that's currently what i'm working on right now is to work on those stress levels because they are still there and it's more of a habit than it is something that's happening to me if that makes sense i got so used to being stressed that i just know how to be stressed yeah. So now I have to like work on not doing that because there is nothing for me to be stressing about, but my body is still in like that stress mode. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit about ADHD? Yeah. Because girls, you know, you're hearing a lot about how girls are diagnosed much less than boys and it's different in girls. And when did you realize, or when did this come to your attention or your parents' attention and how have you, um, you know, I, I don't want anyone to follow this story, and I will tell the truth. But <laughs> it was in college. Uh, well, I was no, it's actually it was after college. My friend had Ritalin, which is like the ADHD medication, and I don't and I don't do these things ever, right? This was like the first and last time where I was like, okay, yeah, because they kept giving me like, yo, like you don't know, like you'll focus, like it's it's like really cool, and I'm like, huh, okay. Because I've never been able to focus in my life. So I took it. And the funny thing about it, it must have been the dosage. (laughs) But uh, while everyone looked like they they had like five cups of coffee, I went to bed. And then I called the next day and was like, I I need to get checked. I think there was something (laughs) that was not okay that I just went straight to bed after after taking something that's supposed to like keep you up and make you focus. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So, and, and then, you know, I spoke to uh, a specialist and uh, a psychiatrist and I, uh, and they're like, yeah, I'm like, dude, I didn't even need to give you the test to tell you, you have it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> but I, I definitely got tested and everything. And it was a big relief. Cause first of all, like it was like my early twenties and that's a long time to go undiagnosed, especially when it's like, you've done all your schooling at that point, you know? So to find out I had it after all my schooling and it would make sense stuff that was happening at work as well that, uh, you know, I had like managers be like, you know, you have to be more organized and uh, maybe you should start scheduling the things that you actually need to do 
I think they could see it and I couldn't see it because <laughs> mm. I would just get everything done when I got it done. Like it was, you know, the typical ADHD stuff. But then the stuff that I was unaware about that was very much something that I struggled with was the depression and like ADHD paralysis, where it's like you become so overwhelmed, you just end up not doing anything. Right. You don't do anything like you don't even move. You're like, do I need to go to the bathroom? Don't know. <laughs> don't right. know but right now i'm not <laughs> um but it, it was it's it's much better to recognize when the symptoms are acting up and when they're and when sometimes they're higher than other times because it depends i guess how stimulated you are but for me when i was doing my master's at that point i already knew and i was so happy that i knew i'm so glad because i i do remember once where i got so overwhelmed that i was about to break down and I kind of just took a deep breath and was just like, okay, this is why you feel this way. You don't need to do all of it. Don't think you need to do everything right now. You just need to do this one little, little thing. Did the one little thing, ended up doing all of it. You know, so it was those little things like that that really helped me in my life. Um, yeah. And so I'm glad that like I got the diagnosis because <laughs> I think like, I and I don't go around being like, you know, like ADHD, whatever, because, you know, you have a lot of people who are like, yeah, it's not real. And you're like, oh, I'm not having this conversation. <laughs> like, I wanted to mention that. because <laughs> well, I, I think, like, yeah, I, I feel mm -hmm. like, no, no, go on, go on. There's a, there's a mood that people, that all the increase in ADHD diagnosis is some sort of cop out and people are using it as an mm -hmm. excuse. And I feel like if you've, been in that position where you just literally don't know why you act a certain way, but you're unable to change it, then it's a tremendous relief to hear. It's so, you know, when I got the diagnosis, it was interesting because, um, so my, one of my, like, I was very serious relationship I was in ended. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I do, and I, and I did, um, like I did own up to like my, my responsibility. My account, I was accountable for what, what happened in the relationship and, he he eventually after years was accountable but <laughs> but i knew like immediately like when i broke up with this person that i'm like well you know like you're this this and this and this you know goes on and these things are causing us a lot of issues and a lot of it seemed to be my fault and it was a lot of communication issues or forgetfulness or like very 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 classic adhd things that were happening and i like I, remember I would have to write things down so that I wouldn't forget because they said that oh well if you cared you would have remembered kind mm. of thing and and you kind of sit there like oh well you're right like what the hell is wrong with me why can't I remember the simplest thing you know and, and it's and it gets very frustrating and very scary so when I came with that when they told me about it I was like oh everything makes sense <laughs> everything makes sense so okay. What time? It was a big relief. It was a huge relief, and it, and it helped me work on like future relationships, you know. Yeah. What have you? So you don't want to go on medication. What do you do? What are some key things that help you? You know, I so I'm not I'm not totally into like big pharma. You know, mm -hmm. I I just I've had more bad things happen than good things when I would take medicines. Like I would, you know, I was allergic to a few things or it would induce like panic attacks. I had like one migraine medication that induced a panic attack. It was weird. I was like, how did this even happen? <laughs> uh, so I like, I'm very reluctant on taking the ADHD meds because I've taken it once and I had a terrible experience. And I know that not all medications are work the same. And I was taking Concerta and I've heard Concerta is probably one of the worst ones. And uh, it just wasn't great. And I just couldn't deal with the crash. So that's why I don't, want to take medications it's more like i'm i feel uneasy about it and i'm a bit terrified of them so i don't think that's a good mindset to go into while taking them because i think it'll just cause more anxiety <laughs> yeah you um need you need to believe in them but i do recognize yeah but i do recognize it's a totally like like viable thing for other people it's just i think not for everybody uh for me when i can get it handled pretty well it's when i have not like a super, super consistent routine, but a routine that doesn't stress me out. So like, if I go, yeah, okay, I need to go to the gym. And the gym is like a big one. The gym helps a lot with, with, uh, 
like the cognitive function and and all that because you're quieting the mind a lot of it for me has to do with quieting my mind okay so it's the gym meditation okay. sports um just like anything that like keeps me moving really like i that that's when that's when i notice that i'm like doing really really well but once i stop all that it it, it it can get kind of bad so i'm still trying to work out the fine line between all of that and i think i'm getting the hang of it uh because it's, it's been a few years but it's definitely better than it was a few years ago so you mentioned working out actually we met at f45 once we figured out we did. <laughs> i was like i know you <laughs> 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 I always yeah. get confused too. I think when people live in two different countries or you've lived in two different parts of the world, it's even more confusing when you can't figure out for, for me anyway. Cause I, Oh start- yeah, no, hundred percent. I'm like, I know you from somewhere. God, where did I meet you? Yeah. <laughs> like, was it on the Middle East? Was it on another <laughs> continent? Where was it? Um, I don't know. I'm like, I hear, hear I'm like, I hear an American accent. Oh crap. Was it in the States? I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> So what's, what's your favorite workout now? What do you like to do to stay strong? So now, um, I'm doing some training with my coach, uh, Kieran. Uh, he's really, really good. You know, you know, Kieran. Kieran, he's awesome. He's he's a, a, so he's the coach at, uh, F45. Yeah. 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 So I started, I started working with Kieran because I had an injury and, uh, and that was in January where, like it was kind of subsiding, subsiding over uh, already because it'd been like a year of having an injury. So I was relatively like almost back to going to the gym, but he rehabbed my leg from now from, from January to now. And now I'm like lifting, I'm doing like a lot of compound movements, a lot of accessory workouts to facilitate those compound movements, um, like the deadlifts and the squats and things like that. So I'm just lifting pretty much right now. And I was speaking to him yesterday and I was like, well, I think I need to start doing cardio. And he's like, you've been needing to do cardio. And I'm like, I know (laughs) that's one of the things that does help with the, with the brain stuff. But it's just like, I can't get myself to do it because I don't like it. (laughs) Hardest thing to go back to if you've stopped working out, I think like in my life of working out, it's like, you can start the cardio, but it's like, the hardest thing is if you feel like you're just going to be sweating and like you want to fall over, who wants to, who wants to dive into that? Right. I just, yeah, I'm just like, I don't know, man. Like he, like he laughed at me. Cause I, I was like, dude, see, I look like I'm strong, but I kind of want to also look a certain way. And like, I think I need to start doing cardio for that. And he's like, yeah, you do. But in other, ter- in other, like whatever, I'm healthy now. And, um, the workouts are great. Again, it's a lot of, uh, I'm doing a lot of glute focused and hamstring, but it's specifically because that is where my injury was. So it was like the gluteus medius and that's, it's actually a, a common thing for women too. Mm-hmm. I heard <laughs> from a lot of doctors that I went to, <laughs> they said the gluteus medius is, is the culprit of that hip pain. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I was having, it was, it, it was like past severe hip pain. It was like to the point of like limping and needing like assistance, you know, from, from the pain, but it is a common thing with, with women to have lower back and hip pain. And we go to the gym so much that we forget sometimes to focus on a very important muscle and it's the minimus and the medius Mm because we just want the maximus to shine, but Mm -hmm. it's actually the smaller muscles is where you get that definition. Funny enough like if like that shelf look it comes from the top not the bottom so so like if you fix the top you'll be good <laughs> you gotta work all the s's <laughs> yeah you gotta work you gotta work all the gluteus you know all the all the all of them and it was very interesting when i found that out i was like huh yeah okay why <laughs> women <laughs> you can't cut corners when you're writing a song you can't cut corners in a lot of ways and so if you do you'll end up paying the price. That's an interesting, that's an interesting approach. I'm going to pay more attention to my gluteus. This is, is yeah, um, no, it, was, it is, it is interesting. Cause it, uh, it was also, um, when, when, cause I was getting a lot of MRIs and CT scans to figure out what the pain was coming from. And, 
And in that process, they found out that I was that I had hyperflexibility. And mm-hmm. so great, your mobility is really, really good. But hey, guess what? It's like an elastic band. The more you stretch it, the more it stretches out. And the more it stretches out, that's what happened to my leg. So it was like if you don't build the muscle around the ligaments to support the hyperflexibility, you're ultimately just gonna crumble. And I I don't know, but I think women are more prone to being hyper flexible than men are but you can't quote me on that i have no idea but i just i think so (laughs) this is a funny because uh, someone just told me this like a physiotherapist just said this and said like yoga is probably really easy for you but you should do more weightlifting even more and you know Mm -hmm. yoga in my life but um weightlifting is the is where it's at i do you feel like weightlifting is the first thing everyone should do or what i i love weightlifting and yeah. it's all I do practically. It, yeah, it's all I do now. And uh, before I was doing when we were doing F45, and like for people who don't know what F45 is, it's like high intensity workouts, like for 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of plyometric movements during the uh, uh, during like the cardio days or whatever. The weight days weren't like super bad, but I do remember that there were more of those plyometric movements throughout the week. So I was like an F45 buddy. I was there every single day. Like, and that's not an exaggeration. <laughs> and it's so, it's like, I wouldn't know because I'm bad actually for your health. <laughs> I didn't see I was you. there every, every day, especially COVID, especially COVID. I was doing those workouts at home like crazy. And uh, it's a lot of jumping, a lot of, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot to put on your body. And for someone who doesn't have the strength to uphold that kind of movement, it can injure you. And uh, that's why I was speaking with the hypoflexibility thing, like if for people with uh, hyperflexibility uh, and just, yeah, in general, um, we don't work that muscle. That's like the, the gluteus minimus or the medius. We don't work it because of the hyperextension of the back. So like we're not like it's almost subconsciously like tilted. I guess, or something like it, it extends farther than the norm, the average person. So it doesn't need to extend that much, but it feels comfortable to do it. And, and that is where the injuries come. Okay. So, and, and so it doesn't work the muscle, you know? Okay. So where do you want to go with your music now? Well, right now I'm rebranding and, um, because the old stuff that I was working on, while it was really great and it was, uh, it was you know, it's a journey for my music career. Uh, I don't think it was totally honest. So I'm gonna be completely honest. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> so it was, it, I just wasn't as vulnerable as I as I probably should have been in my music. And so when I would listen back to it, I'm like, you know, that there were other stuff that you wanted to say, mm-hmm. and you did not say it. And so I almost felt like a fraud. So I took it all down and now I'm like, I'm going to do some new stuff and just be exactly what that I am. And if people accept it, that's great. And if they don't, well, I have a really great memory, so that's okay. (laughs) But uh, the new stuff is going to be cool. I'm really excited. There's different, different vibes, some more dancey, some more R&B, but yeah, it's going to be cool. This is exciting. You seem like someone who, I don't know if it feels like this for you, but you, you are comfortable with just upending your life to do what you want does it feel that way for you yes yes it does and like this goes to the impulsivity trait <laughs> um i have more than once uh three times i have up and moved my life four times maybe even maybe three um where i've just been like okay i'm going on a plane and i'm leaving bye <laughs> so <laughs> Like my university, I didn't think about it. I, I was, I got my visa like two days before I was supposed to go to school, and then I went. And then when I, I got there after a little while, I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. And so I moved mountains to move to a different country, even farther away from the Middle East. So, so I was in Europe, and then I moved to the States, and then I came back, and then I went again. <laughs> and I was just kind of like, okay, bye. And I didn't think about it. And it's something that I'll think about sometimes, and like was that necessary like maybe you should have put a little more thought into that but um it's kind of always worked out so uh i guess it's a habit that uh hopefully is 
not a dangerous one. <laughs> and when can people like who are interested expect to hear some of your work? No pressure. Uh, well, here's the thing. Uh, I'm working between here and New York. So it's like super hard to get that, that stuff done on time, to be honest. And I'm not using it as an excuse, but it's 100% my excuse right now. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping by the end of summer, there are three songs out. That is my wish. But uh, it, I think if you just follow me on Instagram for now, which I barely post on there as well, because that's all a whole social media cleanse for a different podcast on another day. Uh, <laughs> but I do post stories on there to keep people uh, updated on what I'm doing and what I'm working on. So it's exciting stuff. And there's stuff on SoundCloud cloud for now okay. if anybody wants to check out the old things we'll put the links in the show notes and i think you've got yeah. you're a really good leader in this space you know taking care of your mental health and putting yourself first i think it's just it's super important and we don't do it enough and it, and it makes me sad like i'll see people who are like oh i hate my job and this is really funny because when when i was in new york i was sitting at a table with these women great great women um and I made a joke about work. And I was like, oh, you know, you know how it is when you hate your job. And they all looked at me and went, no. And I that's when I realized, oh, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> yeah. Not normal. You know, you know what yeah. I mean? It kind of just clicked. Yeah. Yeah. So it like clicked and I was like, oh, <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, that's really cool. Listen, thank you so much for talking to us. I really appreciate it. No, I also thank you so much for having me. I, I tend to ramble. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>